Matthew. All right, Matthew Oliver, House of Oliver. And right now you're taking time out of your busy day to join with us on our YouTube video. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And hey, since you're this clever to get informed and stay informed, how about do something else and watch some other videos because there's more information on there because being informed is so key in seeing the change that we need in California, in our communities right now. Also, subscribe, like, share, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell an enemy, <laughs> irritate someone with truth and awesome information. I am sitting right now with probably one of the most radical people I have met thus far in the campaign. And I'll say radical because you're running for governor. <laughs> yes. That is big deal. The one and only Sean Collins. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for having me here on your show. I really appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure well, to meet you today. Well, I like it. I've won. I mean, there's so much I want to ask you because I, and I could get this all wrong. That's why we do these is to get informed and know things. But uh, you served in the military. I did. You did tours in Afghanistan? I did. I did one tour in Afghanistan. Okay, That's talk correct. to me about that. Yeah, so, well, I'll, I'll first say, so I have an undergraduate degree, uh, four-year university, and then I got a degree from, a law degree from the University of Texas. So I got seven wow. years of formal education. But I always make sure I point out that my one year in Afghanistan was the biggest education of my life. Wow because I came face to face with life in general. What year, uh, how old were you when you enlisted? So I was, I was an officer, so I was a Navy JAG officer. So I joined when I was 25 years old. When I was in Afghanistan, I had just turned 30 years old. Wow. And the irony of it is as a 30 year old, I was one of the people with the most life experience in my unit. Yeah. So I was assigned to a security forces advisory team there in Kandahar City. So I had a unit that was a hybrid of a bunch of Army Rangers and a lot of other people with combat experience. And we were assigned to a very high value tal or, or a senior commander in the Afghan army. What what made you at 25? So my daughter just yeah. enlisted at 18 yep. in the army. What made you at 25 go? I've done this. I've seen some of life. You know what? Now what I want to do? Going to go risk it all overseas. Like what? What motivated you to want to go do this? Service to my country. Wow. It's what my family does. It's what the Collins family does. So my grandfather's World War II veteran. Yeah. My father is a Vietnam era veteran. My older brother's a surface warfare officer. So for me, it was just a natural progression. I, I knew wow. I wanted to serve this country. And at the time, we were in Iraq and Afghanistan when I joined. And so I'm watching everybody go off and do their part to support the global war on terrorism. And so I couldn't just stand there and watch others do it. I wanted to be a part of it. I love Which kind country. of leads you to right now what you're doing. You can't just stand back and watch others. You're stepping up and fighting for your state. That's absolutely right. I love this state. I love the state of California. And so I'm not leaving. Look, I recognize that that's an option. <laughs> that's an option right now. And I'm not faulting well, anybody that makes that choice. Especially when you have family in Texas and, and all over. I mean, we have people leaving to Texas. That's right. Uh, yeah. But you're choosing to stay and fight. For the past 17 years since I moved to California, moved to California back in 2005, I've had family members in Texas say, you do realize everybody's leaving your state and coming here. Yeah. Why don't you follow them? I said, no, this is my home. This is where I'm wow. raising my wife and I want to raise our four children at. And I've always been the type of person where I don't like to sit around and complain about something. If you know, if you see something that you don't like, be a part of it. Be an agent of change is my mantra. And so I'm not running. I've never backed down from a fight in my life. And I want to live in California and I want to live a certain life in California. And if I want to see change, I decided I'm going to be an agent of it. Well, and that's, I respect you for it because that's why I'm here. Yeah. Uh, we thought about leaving and uh, I've never been involved in politics in my entire life and I'm not wild enough to run for governor. <laughs> um, but I respect it because I have seen a lot of people go and those that are willing to stay and fight. Mm -hmm. I have a, a lot of respect for, a great appreciation and value for, but it is a fight. Um, you know, we had a recall on this governor. Right. It, we weren't able to get there. It yeah. didn't, I mean, we didn't scratch the surface of what we wanted to do with the recall, other than the fact that we scared the governor into raising more money than Hillary Clinton did for her presidential campaign. He raised for a recall <clears throat> campaign. Right. Um, other than that, I mean, he was a little scared, but he, we, we didn't scratch the surface. It's an uphill battle right. to get him removed. How do you do that? That's a great question. Well, first of all, I'll start with the recall. So when you look at, the, I call it the autopsy from the recall, there were a lot of things that we could have done better as a Republican Party. So we shouldn't be discouraged, first of all, because yeah. it took a lot of signatures to get that recall to even happen. Heck One yeah. of the reasons why he was scared is he tried to label it the Republican recall, but it took a lot of Democrat signatures to yep. make that happen. So he knew that people in my own party are pissed off with me. Yeah. So he was scared to I the like point that. where he went out and raised over $100 million. That's a win. <laughs> so we have to start there. It's like, okay, we had the momentum. At what point in time did we lose the momentum? You look at 
the people that voted yes on the recall, a lot of Democrats voted yes on the recall, but what you notice is a lot of people did not pick one of the alternatives. And so a lot of that had to do with that Larry Elder came in and sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room. Sure. So a lot of the other candidates that I thought were really talented down ballot, they had a very short timeline. So like a Kevin Kyler, who's somebody that lives here in sure. this area, very talented politician, but he did not have enough time to let the entire state know I'm a good alternative to Gavin Newsom. Yeah. So it really boiled down to a lot of people that said, okay, this guy's doing a terrible job and I don't like what he's doing right now, but the devil I know is better than the devil I don't because sure. I have a condensed timeline. So my point being, and my message is to Californians right now is we have a now full election cycle coming up. If you're here, if you're a Californian, if you're an MPP, if you're a Democrat, or even if you're a Republican that voted yes or no on the recall, because you didn't know which alternative you wanted to pick, you now have a long time frame to evaluate candidates sure. and pick an alternative to the guy that you know is failing the state in a major way. For, and 100% he is. And I have, because we're just meeting each other and already I have no idea of the things I do and don't know, but I want to know more about you. So let's yeah. go, let, let's strip back a couple of layers with some really right. rapid fire, just quick questions. Yeah. Because one, I find a lot of people get stuck in COVID um, concerns, right? Vaccines, yeah. masks, businesses, and those are important to me. Those are important to you guys. Right. But it goes a lot further than that. Exactly. We have, right. um, pro-life, border, taxes, all sorts of issues that are involved in that. So the first thing to say is in the world of education and with student mask mandates, student vaccine mandates, are you pro-mandating children for masks in schools? I'm anti-mandate anything. Okay. People should be, have the right to make whatever decisions they want to make. And I want to be clear about that. The government should never be mandating that people do anything. So my wife and I, the other morning, we were having a discussion about, it was a health related situation with, so I have four children, nine, seven, four, and two. Whoa, and with hey the four year old, we were talking about, well, you know, he's been coughing a lot. Should we go in and get him swabbed? And so we're having this back and forth as parents. Like, yeah. is that the best decision to make for our child? Is it worth us going all the way over to the hospital to have him swabbed? Or should we just monitor the situation? Okay, that's our right as parents. Yeah, we should on. have that dialogue. That's what good parents do yeah. is they sit down and take 15 to 20 minutes out of their day and they have a healthy dialogue about what's best for their child. Every parent should have that right. Yeah. Government shouldn't be mandating anything that a parent should be doing with their child. Now, here's the thing. If there's a parent that feels like I feel more comfortable with my child walking into school with a mask, so be it. Nobody's going to tell you because that's the other thing. We shouldn't mandate that a kid can't wear a mask. If that's the parent's decision, that's the parent's decision. You make that decision. 100%. And you'd be surprised how many people have sat right where you're sitting and they can't answer that question. Yeah. And oh, my wife with four me. children, my wife yeah, and I have right? thought this through a, a thousand different angles because that's, that's God gave us four very yeah. beautiful gifts. I love that. You know, and that's our most prized possession in the world. More valuable than your, anything. Man, it's going to keep you young. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so that's solid. So then let me ask you this question. And again, just because I don't know, how long have you been part of the Republican Party? I've been, so that's a great question, actually. So I've been part of the Republican Party, to answer your question directly. I've been a part of the Republican Party. I believe I registered for the first time in 2002. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not sure. But so I grew up in a Democrat household. So I'm probably wow. the most unlikely Republican candidate <laughs> to be sitting here talking to you because yeah. I didn't grow up around Republican politics. So my parents divorced when I was three. My dad had primary custody of us. My dad was an electrician. They handed him his union registration card and his Democrat registration card wow. at the same time, probably. Yeah. And so my entire childhood, I listened to my dad growing up saying, son, because again, I grew up in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. He said, son, Democrats are the only people that care about our community. And it's like, Dad, I hear what you're saying, but I'm looking out the window, and when I walk to school, it does not look like they care very much about our community because yeah. this place is getting worse by the day. Yeah. And he'd always say, oh, that's because of the Republicans. I'd say, Dad, there's not an elected Republican within 20 square miles of us, <laughs> okay? We can't keep blaming the Republicans. Yeah. And by the way, there was an elected politician in our area that had been indicted twice for, like, embezzling funds. It's like, okay, he's personally enriching himself, but we're still struggling around here. So I kind of became apolitical throughout high school. And it was like, Dad, you know, I hear you, but I'm kind of tuning you out. Yeah. I get to college. So I go to Rice University down in Houston, Texas. And at the time, there was the governor of Texas, a guy named George W. Bush, that was running for president at the time. <laughs> and so he started talking about compassionate conservatism. And so I loved that because I was like, OK, it's, it's possible to have compassion for mankind, yet still be true to your conservative values and use those conservative values to actually help mankind. Yeah. 
to be a positive force for change isn't, to mankind. Isn't that such an interesting idea? Yeah. Uh, and so I was wild. moved by that. I was wow. moved by that. And so that captivated me. And that at that point in time, that's when I started identifying as a Republican because it was a light bulb moment for me. It's like, okay, if I want to have a, a meaningful impact on my community, that's the type of conservative values and politics that are actually going to move the needle. Yeah. I think, I think that's so important. So when you're this community you grew up in, yeah. which is probably vastly different than the community in this world I grew up in, but to still come to the same place of when we need to see change, we're willing to fight for our state. Right. You're putting it all out on the line to see it happen. So you, you have these belief and value system. How do you think, and these are some of the questions I think people are looking for beyond just COVID politics. Right. Where are you at on pro-life, pro-choice? Yeah. And that's a tough one in the state of California. It's a very tough one in the state of California. I always come at things from personal perspective. So it's the lens that I looked at the world through. So I was raised in the Catholic Church. So my dad, my mom was a member at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, Pastor Tony Evans. So I kind of grew up in that mm -hmm. church via my mom. So I kind of, those were my two faith-based, you know, yeah. lanes that I lived in growing up. And um, so to answer your question directly, I'm pro-life. Yep. But I'm pro-life for very personal reasons. So I'm also pro-life with exceptions. And I'll, I'll say the, the one exception being the life of the mother. I actually lived that. Wow. So when my oldest was born, I told my wife, hey, I'm going downstairs to grab coffee. And as I'm walking out the door, some nurses busted through the door. And I, like, kind of moved out of the way. And so they start getting my wife's heart rate back up. And so for about three minutes, I felt like three minutes. It could have been longer than that. I'm having a real conversation with the doctor about, all right, if we can't get her heart rate back up, we're going to have to make some big boy decisions. Yeah, tough decisions. Okay. And I can't speak for anybody else in the world, but my wife is my best friend on the planet. Yeah. Like on. I can't envision living my life without my wife. And so at that moment in time, I said, I need her here because we can have eight, 10, 15 more children if I have her here. Yeah. Okay. But if she's not here with me, I don't know what that future is going to look like. Yeah. Thank God. We did not have to make that decision. We got our heart rate back up. They stabilized my oldest son. And so he's here with us. But yes, I mean, we, we have four beautiful children as a result of it. Um, yeah. But and I'm also pro-life from the standpoint of I recognize how like incredibly difficult it is to bring a life into this world. Yeah. So we had our first two children. And then after our first two children, we tried to have a third and we struggled. We went through some pretty traumatic uh, miscarriages that my wife and I are very open about. Yeah. Uh, one of them happened when we were actually going to do a, f a family photo shoot in a valet at a hotel. You know, the baby just dropped out right there in the valet. Wow. It was very wow. traumatic. And so when you talk about the value of a baby's life and how hard I've also had my sister-in-law and a lot of close friends that have gone through lots of miscarriages, I know how very difficult it is to bring a human life into this world. And so I cherish it. I value it. Um, so when I say I'm pro-life, I don't mm. say it from the standpoint of I'm trying to say I'm right, you're wrong, and it's a political point. I'm just telling you I've lived a life whereby every human life that comes into this world, it is valuable. Very I, I so respect that. I, I don't get too often into my personal stories, but my wife and I, we lost twins hmm. and went through miscarriages. We did, My youngest is 17, and then now I have a three-year-old. And people yeah. go, oh, so this is your second marriage. No. <laughs> uh, still all with my wife. But we stopped. We had miscarriages, mm -hmm. and then we quit because it breaks your heart because these are your it's kids. Very and um, so I respect it. I respect it more when people realize, one, there were some good laws created that got abused, and that's why now this late-term abortions and everything. Originally, you had some laws there for protecting mothers and right. in these emergency situations where now they've been abused and taken advantage of, and now you have people creating businesses right. off of abusing laws that have been um, twisted into horrible ways. Right. Um, so now what we got to do is get back to the origin. What was the intent? What are we doing and why is it important? That's right. But life is important. And what I love is over the last couple of years, we've been fighting for life, mm -hmm. fighting for the lives of, for me, my employees, fighting for the lives of kids, fighting for the lives of those uh, rights. And we're still fighting for those lives. Yep. And um, it's got to be more than just get them born. Yes. We got to fight for them all the way once they're born which yeah. um most of the time i don't do any pre-conversation and uh, it gets me in trouble all the time but we had a <laughs> small moment of pre-conversation because i don't know when we're dropping this video but sacramento just experienced a devastating um loss the other night uh mass shooting right where 
and, and, and I hope as I'm saying this, that the facts are still the same and, and that more don't pass, but six had been murdered, uh, brutally murdered and 12 injured in a mm-hmm. drive-by shooting. Um, and they've caught two, or they're saying they've caught two people in connection with the crime, one of whom was serving a 10 year term for domestic violence and had been released early despite the DA's pleas of, you know, this is a violent criminal. Right. Don't release him. Released him early. He goes out, gets a gun, commits a horrific act. And now we have people in the state, including our current governor, saying these are gun issues. Right. I look at this, I don't see a gun issue. That's right. I see a lot of issues. I don't see a gun issue. How would you address that? So first of all, I'll say that's a cop out. Whenever you want to go immediately to this is a gun issue, it's a total cop out. First of all, let's start with the fact that California has the most restrictive laws in all of America. Yep. Okay. And the gun crime still happened. So the problem is, is when you fixate on the guns, you're not focusing on the underlying causes. So for instance, here in the state of California, with the assistance of our governor, we have created an ecosystem whereby criminals are encouraged to do what they are doing. You know, this individual that got released early, he should never have been released early. And if we had systems in place and laws in place that actually took crime seriously, he would have never been on the streets and capable of doing what he did. Yeah. You know, and I could go on for days and days in terms of the environment that we have created, whereby criminals feel safe enough to do the stuff that that just happened in Sacramento. You know, Prop 47, um, the fact that we've been beating up on our police, we've been defunding police. You know, the L.A. sheriff just recently told people, don't wear your expensive jewelry or drive your nice cars. Wait, when wait, I, wait a second. Did you not hear about no, that? No, this yes. cannot be a real deal. The Los Angeles County Sheriff put out a wow. message to the citizens of Los Angeles County. I'd advise you not to wear your expensive jewelry or to drive nice cars because you are at risk now a lot of people were angry at him and at first i was kind of confused i was like okay the sheriff has just acknowledged that the criminals are in charge yeah but then i reflected on it a little bit and i almost felt like okay that's a plea for help yeah because he's living in a time whereby people are beating up on police so he's having an issue recruiting enough bodies to actually do the job that he's been tasked with and he's probably under resourced yeah that is a glaring example of why we have to start supporting police and, and how do you see, what are some changes that you think you get elected? Yeah. What, what do you do? How do we address this? What are the changes we make? Yeah. So first of all, we have to get rid of all the laws that are basically emboldening police, police officers. Well, let's, let me, the first thing we need to do is we need to start having our police's back again. Let's get rid of all this defund the police nonsense. And Democrats yeah. have even bought into it because Gavin Newsom has even recently come out and said that was probably a bad idea. Well, you know, no right kidding. now that there it is was a, a really bad idea. There is a, a, a proposal, a bill that's being proposed to um, charge the police or, or put some sort of tax or defund on the police because they weren't enforcing COVID guidelines that were obtuse and obscure and random. And but. Now they're trying to, they're attacking our police. Every time you turn around this state, our politicians are attacking our police officers. You're absolutely right. And because they are attacking police officers, like I say, they're making good cops want to retire because they're like, I've had enough of this. And then the otherwise young group of individuals that said, hey, I've always wanted to be in law law enforcement. That's the profession I want to make my calling. They're saying, maybe I should do something else because I could potentially end up in jail. Yeah. with the, the the restrictions and things that they're imposing on police right now. The laws so that we have, yeah. as the governor, that's something that you can do is you can uplift police. And look, as a governor, you're not going to be able to legislate that right now. We still have a big problem in terms of Democrats consult, control 80 percent of the legislature. But the one great thing or two great powers that a governor has is they have the bully pulpit. They can take their message directly to the people. One thing I would do immediately as the governor, Prop 47. So I don't have the ability as the governor to repeal that thing. And it's going to take votes in the assembly, which is still controlled by Democrats. But what I can do is go to the people of California and say, hey, you remember when they sold Prop 47 to you as a good thing for California? Let me show you the stats on what it's called. Yes. Look at the property crime that's gone up in every major city in America. The Los Angeles County Sheriff is telling you not to wear your personal jewelry because people know they can snatch it off your neck and get charged with the misdemeanor. Yeah. You still feel good about Prop 47? If you don't, either start voting for Republicans and put them in the assembly or put pressure on your current elected Democrat that if they don't immediately repeal Prop 47, they're going to be looking for a new job. Yeah, let's make a change. Now, have you been in politics before? I have not been in politics before. This is my first foray. Yeah. So I was a congressional candidate for about nine months leading up to this. But yeah, I have not been formally elected to public office before. Not not a school board, not a little league uh, commission. I mean, no. 
Wow, what did your wife say? Because you know one of the things I've really respected while we're talking is your partnership with your wife. Right. And the the just you can see it in you, the exuding of this is a team effort. Yeah. What did your wife say? I mean, how does that conversation <laughs> go? Uh, hey, babe, by the way, uh, I'm going to run for governor. Like, yeah. Did you just wake up one day? Was she like, no, because you're an attorney right now. Is I'm an correct? attorney yeah. right now. Yeah. You're a smart guy. Like, <laughs> did you have to get an attorney to talk yeah. to your wife? Like, I need to know this. Well, I'll start with my wife is an attorney. So <laughs> we definitely had a very. <laughs> it was well, a very. It was a, yeah, it was a uh, very detailed argument. Oh, that went wow. back. It was no argument, actually. Cool. So I'll tell you exactly the moment that I decided I was going to get involved. And I'll tell you, so it's the reason why I decided I want to run for Congress. So my wife knows me. She knows I get very passionate about. So, so I've always been very active in terms of following politics. Sure. I'm one of those people that when I get my ballot, I go sit in front of my computer for about four hours and I go through everybody's website. I want to know everything about them. And I wish of more of us did because we have people in school boards right now. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I was the dude. Get the ballot. Yeah. I have no idea who's running for school board. And it says like maybe a job next to them or something. Yeah. And by the way, I'm finding out they can make those up. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> that can't be fair. But, and I'm just looking at names or something that rhymes or maybe something that makes me feel happy. And I'm just circling people. That is exactly why we're in the position. I am 100%. part of the problem, which we're trying to change that right now. Because when you get that ballot and you see governor and you realize, you know, just what you said when you started, we're not happy with our governor. Yep. But there's a whole list of names and yeah. I'm not going to bring them all on here because I don't want to waste your time. So let's get the good ones and let's make the right change for our state, but That's keep right. going. Talk nope. to about so this. like I say, I research every single for, if you're running for a water district, if you're running for school board, I go through your website yeah. and I want to ask, I want I'm looking for the information on your website. That's important to me, whether yeah. or not I'm going to vote for you. And I would encourage people to do that for me. Yeah. Sean Collins for governor. Uh, you can Google it. It should be the first thing that pops up. Please go to Sean Collins for governor and research everything that I've said because I want to be the right candidate. It's a great you. website, but somebody gave me some faulty information. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of cool. But yeah. We get a laugh about it. Afterwards. So, but getting back to how we, I arrived at this, in July of 2020, I had an incident happen with my oldest son. So he was seven at the time. So okay. we lived down in Orange County, California. And if you're familiar with Orange County, I'm driving him to a sporting event of his in Ladera Ranch. And there was a Black Lives Matter rally going on, which, look, I love freedom of speech. I love freedom of assembly. That's what America is all about. I always say, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend to my death your right to say it. That's not a quote for me. I've lived it. I've done combat deployments in Afghanistan. I've seen what happens to people in Afghanistan who disagree with the government. They put a bullet in the back of their head. Yeah. We don't do that in America. We respect people's opinions. And that's why I'm a big advocate for freedom. I will always be a big advocate for freedom because it's what makes us America. Yeah. Okay. So I'm driving my son to this rally. There's a person in the rally that has a sign up that says modern day slavery, which is their absolute right. It was a young 20 year old white male. That's his absolute right to have that opinion. I guess I'm assuming he was insinuating that black people are currently in this country living under a form of modern day slavery. Which so my, he would know. He would know very well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he Which would, is, well, that kind of gets to what bothered me about the sign. It's yeah. like, okay, you're a very young 20-year-old white male. Presumably you grew up in Orange County. What context do you have for that comment? Come my on. oldest leans over to me and says, Dad, I thought slavery was over. <laughs> He's seven. And that's my oldest. I've never had one of my children pose that complex of a question to me. So Come I didn't on. really know how to approach it. So I talked to him about it and I said, look, that's just their opinion. And they're exercising their First Amendment right to, to, to assemble and free speech and the whole nine. And that's what makes this country amazing, son. The yeah. fact that he has the right to do that and anybody else can. So I was, I'm at home that night reflecting with, it, uh, with my wife. And I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, what bothered me about that sign is my mom drank from black only fountains. Wow. Okay. I've never used a segregated bath bathroom a day in my life. I've never drank from a black only fountain a day in my life. Okay, my mom did. And I also remember in the 80s when my mom, a white friend of mine, invited me over to their house to play. And my mom got emotional. I said, Mom, what are you getting emotional about? She said, I'm emotional because you're growing up in a better world than the one I grew up in. Wow. Okay, that was the 80s. Where my mom is recognizing that this country is getting better. Yeah. Progressively getting better. Is it perfect? No, but we're getting better. We're on an upward descent. All right. Now, here I am in 2020 trying to explain to my son that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation a long time ago, son, and that slavery or a plantation are not a reality for you because wow. of how we're talking to each other. 
And so my big problem with that kid is he lives, I'm assuming, in my area. Our elected representative, my congresswoman right now, she's not going to be after redistricting, is Katie Porter. Okay. So Katie Porter is part of the progressive squad, AOC, yeah. Elon yeah. Omar, yeah. the people who peddle this narrative that America is fundamentally racist and that systemic racism is going to hold you back. Because here's the thing. I would be a fraud if I sat up there and said something like that. I'm a law partner at one of the best law firms in California. Wow. And I run our consumer protection practice group there. Okay. And my peers view me as one of the talented attorneys in our law firm. Yeah. Okay. So to suggest that is inherently flawed. And so it was just one of those things. I got to the point where I said, you know what? I got to be a part of the dialogue because our young people are watching this. Yeah. Okay. They're being influenced and everything that comes out of our mouths, they're watching it. And again, as I told you, I'm always of the opinion that if you want to see change, be the change that you want to see. So I decided, hey, I'm going to run against, I'm going to run for Congress and get Katie Porter out of Congress. And, and you went from there. Yep. To governor. to governor. That's right. So <laughs> redistricting, redistricting happened. Okay. And that, and that changes everything. I well, wanna, before we do that, I want to go back yeah. to a thought that. I seldom get people who goes very Irish background in history and lineage, and my father-in-law was born in Dublin, and it, we're as Irishy as you can get in our family, and um, they have belief systems. But I don't have people come up to me and tell me the way I'm supposed to feel about my heritage. Right. Um, it's seldom that someone says, "This is how you should feel about cabbage," you know, <laughs> and, and a potato to me. Right. Like this, you know, they they just don't do it. It's not. I don't know how it feels when somebody who is completely removed from your culture is trying to project on you the right. way you're supposed to feel about your culture. I, I don't have a grid for that. I, yeah. I guess hearing you talk about it really infuriates me. Like I would be really not happy if someone's trying to tell me the way I'm supposed to feel about the way things are about me. Right. I, well, it bothers me. I mean, I could go, I could give you some other example. One glaring example is the first time I heard defund the police. I was like, they got to be kidding, right? <laughs> and my wife said, well, what do you mean? I said, Z. I said, yeah, my older brother and I, Quincy, I said, is it, Quincy and I used to have to walk about three quarters of a mile to my aunt's house after school until my dad could get off of work to pick us up. Yeah. And at that time, in the 80s, kids were getting jumped for their sneakers and their clothes on the way home. Well, just so, don't wear them. Just yeah, don't wear Exactly. Don't wear According sneakers to the Los clothes. Angeles County Sheriff, <laughs> yeah, I should just, just wear them. That That's was my your fault. fault. Yeah, exactly, yeah, right? You didn't know exactly. this was your problem. So, but we would, there was a police officer, a Dallas police officer, that would pull up to this convenience store in the corner. So my brother and I would go over and try to act like we knew the guy to kind of create this cloak of invincibility. Hey, you better not mess with us while we're walking home. Yeah. And so I told my wife, I said, there's a kid just like that in the low income community all over America right now who's relying on that police exactly. officer to get home. OK, what do you think is going to happen the moment they start defunding police? Which budget is going to get first? It's well, not going to be the Beverly Hills. I'm sorry to mess up your, your, your story here, but AOC is telling you that telling you that those kids are afraid of that police officer. The AOC. <laughs> I mean, they're the ones. That's because AOC you. probably never had to walk well, home. <laughs> see, if they don't yeah. need it. Right. They're painting a narrative. That's just not true. And they're selling it to America or they're selling it to California or they're selling it to Orange County saying, right, this is the way it is. They're all scared of the police. So defund the police. Yeah. And you're sitting here saying from somebody who's been there, lived it, yeah. done it. If it wasn't for those police, I don't know where I'd be. Well, and here's the best part about it. The police officer I'm talking about was a black police officer. A lot of the police officers in my community were black police officers yeah. who grew up in the community and wanted the community <laughs> to be better. So you're just blowing wrap up. that you're around, wrap that around your head for a second. OK, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. And so I told my wife, I was like, they are doing harm to the very people that they think they're speaking on behalf of because it's going to be the middle income and low income people that receive the negative end of defunding the police. And what's happening? We're seeing it happening all over America right now. Crime is at all time highs in the south side of Chicago. Crime is at all time high in inner city L.A. Inner city, San Francisco. Name well, in San Francisco, they've come back. San Francisco yeah. has come back and said, uh, uh, "How do we, we need the police? Right. <laughs> we need you back. And by the way, can we get Walgreens back and Target back? And <laughs> can we get some shops back in here? Because right. not only are the police leaving, yeah. all of the businesses are leaving. Right. And all of those necessities they need to keep it a vibrant community are going. And That's right. It's going downhill.
Well, one, one of our big messages as a gubernatorial candidate, I've been telling people public safety is the number one responsibility of every elected official, regardless of what office you're running for, but especially for a governor. And if people don't feel safe walking out their front door in the morning to go to their place of employment, or if they don't feel safe when their children have to walk to school, you have failed because yeah. society can't function. If that person can't go to work for fear of being mugged, if their children can't go to school for fear of being beat up, you have failed. Society cannot function. Like, you have to get that right. If you don't get anything else right, you have to get that right. And our governor is failing miserably on that front. So speaking about, and, and I know we can be here for hours talking about it, and, I, and I, yeah. I'm actually really enjoying this dialogue. I, I'm enjoying everything that you're representing and standing for. Let's talk about homelessness. Yeah. Big issue. Very big issue. Um, it appears that there's no amount of money that can fix this issue. Right. Uh, government, California right now, we spend about $6 billion a year on homelessness. That's right. What do we do? So I'll start with, there is an amount of money that can fix it. It's, it's not a, a how much money are we spending, it's how are we spending uh -huh. the money, okay? Because right now we're spending that $6 billion a year on a housing first policy. And it is a complete and utter failure. So the because housing they think homelessness has to do with the lack of housing. Exactly. <laughs> so the mindset is of the Democrat legislature here in the state is if we can get a house for each one of the homeless people where they can go rest their head at night, we solve the problem. That's not the problem. And I'll tell you why it's not the problem. Two thirds of our homeless in this state are either drug addicted or mentally ill. I'll start with the drug addicted. I have an uncle who's living on Skid Row right now. OK, he has been addicted to drugs for the better part of his life. OK, he is sick. Yeah. And housing's not going to solve the problem because our family has been offering him housing for the better part of my, my life, okay? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want our housing option because he can't use drugs in our home. And so what you need to understand about a drug addict is if you put a roof over their head, they will leave the comfort of that home and to go seek drugs yeah. because they're sick. And what the data shows is most of them, when they leave the housing that's provided to them and go back onto the streets, they usually live on the streets closest in proximity to the drug dealer. Why? Wow because they need to be close to the drug dealer. So unless you have policies that actually address the underlying, uh, underlying causes of drug addiction and mental illness, you're going to be throwing good money after bad. Well, and it's all tied together. We're talking about dealing with mental illness, dealing with actual criminal laws, That's right. dealing with more police on the street. I mean, yeah. it's all interwoven, but you're right. We continue to do the wrong things. We have gun violence. Oh, it's guns. We have homeless issue. We need houses. Right. And Really what they're doing is perpetuating more programs that just to fund more money and That's take right. more tax dollars and, yeah. and nothing's better. That's the right. state's worse off. And you know the thing that concerns me about it the most is that it's gotten to the point where I think some Democrats recognize that it doesn't work, but they're so proud. They're so, that it, it's pride at this point in time. They'd rather continue spending hard-earned taxpayers' dollars to try to prove that they're right. I mean, this, yeah. housing, this housing first policy is going to work. If we have to spend a million dollars yeah. per unit, we're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and once we get those 177,000 housing units, then I'll prove to you that I'm right. But at yeah. what cost? Bankrupting our state, making our streets and our wow. cities less safe. At yeah. what cost? At what point are you willing to swallow your pride and say, we were wrong. Let's try something new. Did you see what they did in Louisiana with Brad Pitt went down there, built all these homes after the hurricane? all of these homes and made all of this thing the majority of those homes are condemned right and the whole project failed and most of the people are now suing them because it went so backwards and it didn't matter how much money how right they tried to do it there's other issues at play and we've right. got to address those issues that's right if we want to make stuff work what are um right now you're in the throes of the campaign. That's One, right. people can donate to the campaign by going to the yeah. website. That's right. Sean Collins for governor. That's Sean the easiest way Collins to get there. for yeah. governor. Or Sean Collins for CA.com for okay. those that like the actual URL. That's the easiest there, way to get there. there. You go. Yeah. And then what, um, what else can they do to help support you right now? How can they get the word out? Yard signs, banners, rallies. What, what are you doing? What can they do to help? So grassroots is something that's really important to me. So in an ideal world, I'd get to all 58 counties before June 7th because I love the grassroots. I was at the Yolo County uh, Central Committee meeting last night. And okay. I absolutely love that. I love being at those town halls and I stay to the very end. Like it, it means something to me. You know, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, we're done with the formal part of it. We're just going to be talking, you know, small town, local politics. I said, that's what I came for. Yeah, I want to hear that. I want to know everything down to, you know, this water main on Main Street has really been a thorn in our side. I want to know about that. 
because everybody in the state of California, their problems are my problems right now. Is the way I see it. Yeah. And so what I would say, my direct ask is for those grassroots folks out there, I want to make contact with you and I'd love for you to be an advocate for me in your county. So if I can't be in your county, please be an advocate for me because I want to be an advocate for all of California. That's my mission. And I'm assuming on your website too, you talk about fires, you talk about more of the issues because I, I know do. people right yeah. now, they're talking about water. They're talking about fires. I mean, yeah. the it's how short our memories are. We move from masks and vaccines <laughs> right to water, fire. We've got drought facing us. Uh, we've got homeless issues, uh, electricity issues, but they're real issues. That's right. Those ones were real issues too, but these are real issues yeah. and we've got to make a change. Yeah. Uh, any last leaving thoughts that you'd like to tell these guys? I would. Like I said, I want to be a cal candidate for all of California. And one thing I do want to touch upon is what you just talked about. Yes, go to my website. And I want you to go to my website and read the entire thing. Because one thing I want to be and the, how I want to distinguish myself from the other gubernatorial candidates, I want to be a solutions-based candidate. One of my biggest pet peeves in life is when people complain about something, but they don't offer a solution. When I was an officer in the military, I'm still in the military, but as an officer in the military, I tell my junior guys, don't bring a problem to me unless you have a solution for it. Wow. Because that means you have actually thought the problem through, and you're actually actively thinking about how you're going to fix it. The same thing applies to me. I'm not going to give that advice to somebody if I'm not going to live it. I want to be a solutions-based candidate. And so... On my website, I have tried to think through the problems and lay out an actual solution as to how I'm going to fix this problem. So, yes, on the website, I talk about water. I talk about fire, the environment, all the big things that impact this state and that are unique to the state of California. So please go there, check out the website. Um, and obviously, I'd love to engage with you. I'd love to get, you know, volunteer support, endorsements, whatever. Um, and then fundraising is a big thing. Here's the reality. The California gubernatorial race is one of the most expensive races in all of America. I've been told it's the second most expensive race behind the president of the United States. Yep. Yep. Gavin Newsom raised over $100 million. Yep. I don't need $100 million. I need enough money to get my message out. But I do need to raise that money so that I can get my message out. Now, is any chance, any chance in the world the governor is actually going to do any debates uh, that Gavin Newsom is going to step on stage with any of you guys and, and debate? So he's going to try to avoid it. You know, he's kind of creating this percept surprise, surprise. Gavin Newsom's a very arrogant guy. So I, <laughs> my perception of him is that he's going to treat us all as peons. Yeah. Like they're not worthy of me standing on a stage with them. But my job, and I got to do the work to do this, my job is to create enough of a groundswell where, whereby people in the state of California, I like what that guy has to say. And I like him a lot better than that governor. And that's going to put him in the position of having to say, all right, well, I got to go toe to toe with him or else he's going to win. But I got to do the work to do that. I think you're doing the work, yeah. and uh, I really appreciate it. Sean Collins, thank you guys right now for joining with us. Make sure you visit the website, like it, subscribe, and then do me a favor. Share this around because there are people who need to hear this message, need to know more about the candidates, be informed, and then check out some other videos, and then visit some really delicious restaurants. I happen to know a few that are yummy. Thank you guys for hanging out with us, and you know how it goes. Until we drink together again, cheers.